In recent years, scientists say there's been an explosion in the use of designer drugs or new psychoactive substances. They're cheap, they're easy to obtain, and they usually escape detection in traditional workplace drug tests. They're sold as household products, not as drugs, to avoid detection, which is why they have names like bath salts, a stimulant, and spice, which is a synthetic version of marijuana. These designer drugs can be not only as addictive as the street drugs they're meant to mimic, but they can be even more potent, and the side effects can be far more harmful. Michael Bauman is a research scientist at the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and Nora Volkov is director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. The two wrote a recent paper in the journal Neuropsychopharmacology about these new designer drugs, their threats, and potential solutions. The drugs are usually created in a lab, often originally for scientific study, and are then abused on the street. Most of these, what we think of as new designer drugs, are not really new at all. The compounds were created years ago by biomedical scientists as potential medications, research tools for studying receptor function, or in some cases, even imaging agents for visualizing specific receptors in the brain. And how many are there? How many different kinds are there in circulation? What type of scope are we talking about? It's uh, difficult to know the exact number of uh, different designer drugs, but the availability and misuse of these substances is a global phenomenon. And it's constantly changing, and this basically reflects the creativity of chemists. Currently, more than 500 distinct psychoactive substances have been identified in 95 different countries by the early warning systems of the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime. Where are they usually made? Well, they are, can be made anywhere. And, and uh, for example, a synthetic drug that is very well known, methamphetamine, is um, done actually in kitchen cabinets and in rural areas. But in the, the bulk itself, or most of these uh, synthetic drugs, comes from Asian laboratories. And then they are sold typically through internet websites in uh, retail shops or by street drug dealers. Dr. Bauman, you mentioned that these drugs were originally created to aid scientific research. How important are they for science? Well, they're actually really critical for scientific research. Um, if we use the synthetic cannabinoids as an example, most of these were made by biomedical scientists um, for specific research purposes. The synthetic cannabinoid compounds that were uh, diverted into spice products were actually originally synthesized to be used as tools to explore the function of the CB1 and CB2 receptors. And so these substances were actually very critical in, in discovering how the endocannabinoid system worked. That is, we have cannabinoids in our own brains that are uh, very important for normal brain function. And the way that this was discovered and sort of characterized were with these research compounds. I'm picturing scientists developing these compounds and using them to study the brain. So how do you go from a compound that's designed for study in the lab to become a drug that's abused on the street? Yeah, that's a really great question. And the Internet has played a really pivotal role in the process. So the synthetic schemes for making these research compounds were originally published in reputable scientific journals. The information is in the public domain. So this situation allowed enterprising chemists or businesses to heist the recipes, make the substances, and then divert them for human use. In the paper, you both put forth a debate about these drugs. Can you outline the two sides? Well, biomedical research um, with designer drugs can be considered dual use in that it can be used, on the one hand, for beneficial uh, purposes, but on the other one, for malicious ones. It could be argued that preclinical research with designer drugs may help clandestine chemists fine-tune their newest analogs and facilitate their diversion towards recreational markets. On the other hand, the scientific information that is derived from these designer drugs offers crucial knowledge about how to treat adverse effects and manage intoxicated patients. And it's also important because it may provide us with leads for novel treatments for addictions as, as well as other psychiatric disorders. The fact that these drugs are largely sold over the Internet and come from overseas makes it a challenge to combat their use. One tool that authorities in the U.S. employ is called drug scheduling. 
In this process, the government authorities determine that the drug is being abused, and then they place it in a particular legal category or schedule. For instance, Schedule 1 makes the sale or use of the drug illegal. But, say the researchers, drug scheduling doesn't always decrease the use of a particular drug. In some cases, the drug seems to become more popular after being labeled a Schedule 1 drug. In other cases, a slightly tweaked version of the drug soon appears on the scene that isn't covered under the previous law. Michael Bauman likens this to a cat-and-mouse game between the authorities and the drug chemists. Additionally, scientists who want to use the drugs for their original purpose as a tool in the lab or want to study new drugs to try to combat their use run into prohibitive bureaucratic challenges. One of the unintended consequences for researchers is that legitimate scientific investigations with the drugs are impeded. And the way this happens is that researchers at academic institutions and government and elsewhere, they have to have a DEA Schedule One license and the infrastructure for drug containment in order to study even a few milligrams of the most strictly controlled substances. As the new designer drugs emerge and then they're placed in the Schedule One control, scientific investigators have to add each new drug to their DEA license. This process of adding the drugs to the license is cumbersome and time-consuming, and a lot of time is lost before any research can, can even begin. Are there steps that could prevent this problem and the bureaucratic load for scientists? Well, um, as a scientist who is faced with this uh, problem, my dream would be that there, is, uh, there could be the creation of a special research class uh, of Schedule One license, which allows legitimate scientists to study any scheduled substance. So that is, once you have a Schedule One license, um, then you could study any drug that becomes Schedule One without having to go through the lengthy process of adding drug by drug to, to the uh, license. Monitoring the use of designer drugs is a challenge because common drug screens don't detect these compounds. And even if some screens were to add popular designer drugs, newer replacement drugs emerge on the scene regularly. But there are ways to monitor the drugs that could help. In the United States, there are various government agencies that are effectively monitoring the emergence of new drugs. Nonetheless, um, there are still significant problems and challenges in identifying new emerging drugs that may be causing localized epidemics. Um, for example, when you have a localized epidemic, a series of patients may be admitted to a hospital emergency department um, with a wide variety and sometimes life-threatening symptoms, but the urine toxicology screens are negative because the designer drugs are not detected by them. Thus, it, uh, one thing that would be very valuable is if there were a network of analytical laboratories that could examine human specimens in real time to provide fast results about the active constituents in urine and blood from these patients. They both say that public awareness about these designer drugs is crucial. For instance, use of synthetic cannabinoids, which are much more dangerous than cannabis, was cut in half in only a few years based on a study done with high school seniors. The researchers believe this is largely because of a public education campaign on the risks of the drug. Dr. Volkov. Clearly the take-home message is that designer drugs are very dangerous substances, which pose risk uh, because not just there's no information which makes it uh, worse, but very importantly, because of their clinical uh, pharmacology, has been uh, manufactured to create very potent compounds. Moreover, there is no quality control in their manufacture and packaging, so, which is another challenge because you cannot really determine what type of a product an individual may be consuming. Products containing designer drugs are often mislabeled, and again, this makes it basically impossible to know what ingredients an individual may be taken or may have taken. The results from the animal studies have shown that designer drugs are, as we've mentioned, are more potent than the drugs they intend to mimic. Overall, the uncertainties regarding the pharmacology of these drugs uh, can result in life-threatening adverse effects, especially when these drugs are abused at higher doses or in conjunction with other drugs or medications, which is frequently the case. Dr. Bauman? I mean, I agree completely with everything that, uh, that, that Nora has said in closing. And I also think that uh, given this information, that we need more uh, basic research on the pharmacology and toxicology of, uh, of these designer drugs. 
because it's only with this new information that we're going to be able to disseminate um, the facts about these substances to the general public, which hopefully will be an important factor in decreasing demand for the drugs. This is the podcast for the journal Neuropsychopharmacology. Michael Bauman and Nora Volkov are authors of the perspective paper, Abuse of New Psychoactive Substances, Threats and Solutions. To read this perspective, among others, visit www.nature.com slash NPP. I'm Cynthia Graber.